Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this session. We talk about leveraging tech-led innovations to create impact at scale. Uh, let me start with a brief round of introductions. My name is Siddharth Nortiel. I'm a partner at Omidya Network India. We're an investment firm focused on social impact. Uh, our purpose is to serve bold entrepreneurs who create a meaningful life for every Indian. And we do that by investing in not-for-profit entities, by giving grants, and also by providing uh, early stage venture capital investments to companies that can provide technology-led solutions that create impact at scale. Our target sector customer segment is somebody we call the next half billion user, who's typically a low middle income Indian, somebody who's come online in the last five years using the mobile phone as a primary way of accessing the internet, uh, more familiar with their own mother tongue, and predominantly somebody who's been historically uh, deprived and not had access to the benefits of what technology can provide. Uh, we've been in India for around 10 years, invested close to $400 million, worked with 100-odd entrepreneurs over the last decade or so, and really we've seen things change in the last five years odd. Uh, as technology has become more prevalent, we found that the ability of entrepreneurs to create impact at scale by serving this previously excluded target segment has really increased. Uh, a study which was done recently by the Impact Investors Council, which is the industry body of all impact investors in India, suggested that there are, over the last decade, 600 early stage uh, innovation-driven impact enterprises that have got started that together serve close to half a billion people. Those are big numbers. And that brings us to the topic of this discussion, which is how do we make sure uh, we can benefit from the learnings that we've all had and share some of those on how can we create impact at scale using uh, technology. With me, I have uh, three entrepreneurs who've been through the journey, uh, Hardika Shah, who's the founder and CEO of uh, Kinara Capital, one of the leading uh, lenders to micro and small and medium enterprises. I have with me Shashank Kumar, co-founder and CEO of Dehart, one of India's leading technology firms focused on uh, the agri-value chain. And I have Gaurav Agarwal, founder of 1MG, which is one of India's largest e-pharmacy and online health chains. Uh, let's start with a brief round of introductions. Uh, Hardika, if I could hand over to you to speak a little bit about yourself, the company, and then we'll go around and then and then move forward. Uh, sure. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, let me just set the context since we're talking about what is going on in the country that uh, that houses you know over a billion people, now where we have sixty million small businesses that um, actually employ over a hundred million people, and a lot of them are at the bottom of the pyramid, right? And yet these 60 million small businesses struggle to get access to credit. Less than 10% have access to formal credit. And the challenges for these, this are really deep rooted. Firstly, there's lack of collateral, no land or property to offer, a security to get a loan. Two thirds of Indians don't even own a home. And in urban India, that's even you know a bigger number. Secondly, it's lack of formalization. Um, just, you know, India is, for small businesses, the ease of doing business is not quite there yet, although it is changing. So this formalization means compliance, paperwork. It just makes it difficult for a small business to actually get their arms around it. Um, and then the last part, so this, you know, this, this lack of formalization, lack of property collateral, and leads to a lack of documentation. There is no footprint of what is possible for small businesses, you know, in terms of what their revenues are, et cetera. And so what we end up with is a large economic engine of 60 million small businesses that drive over 30% of the country's GDP, 40, 45% of the industrial output and, and exports are unable to get uh, access to credit. Now, this is where Kinara Capital comes in. Kinara is a socially conscious fintech, and we have been providing loans to micro and small businesses in India for almost a decade. I feel so old saying that, but uh, we build a digital lending solution that provides small loans in the range of eight to ten thousand um, dollars to manufacturing, trading, and services businesses. And we do this in a high-touch, high-tech model, a data-driven decisioning model with last-mile distribution, last-mile doorstep service across over 100 cities in six states in southern and western India. To date, we have actually dispersed over $300 million across 60,000, 70,000 loans. This has helped increase entrepreneur income 
by 2025%. It has created more than 70,000 jobs at the bottom of the pyramid and sustained over a million livelihoods. And all this while we remain profitable for the last six years. So that's uh, that's Kinara in a nutshell in the context of uh, small businesses in India. There are mutes in that. Sorry, just one minute. Thank you, thank you, Adhika. That's a super journey, and we'll speak more about this in the next uh, next few sessions. Shashank, if I hand it over to you for a quick introduction. Thanks, Siddharth. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Shashank, uh, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Dehat. Uh, for Dehat, impact was the default setting. It uh, it was a conscious. Uh, a choice for us because that's where that's how it all started uh being from farmer's family by the time i was 26 somehow got exposed to both the ends of food chain somehow could not understand the gap between farmers and this multi-billion dollar industry and that's where it all started uh it's been close to a decade we have been in this space uh our journey started with mere 14 Farmers, uh, which is today more than uh, 6.8 lakhs farmers, which is close to 0.7 million farmers. So, and again, I mean, the only reason why we could stick to this sector, which is uh, today agri-tech, when we started, this was agriculture, uh, is the impact. Uh, and uh, I can't express, right? I mean, SOCAP, obviously, right? I mean, since years, we have been hearing that, hey, you are into impact space you're trying to do something in agri you must attend socap so it's it's great to be here today uh, about dehat it's it's a farmer's first uh, you know company we have been trying to bring everything related to agriculture under one roof so right from which crop to grow how to grow to where to sell it's a seed to market model so whichever crop farmer is growing they get access to complete end-to-end -end agricultural value chain services, right from agricultural input, crop advisory, financial services, which is the most recent one, and uh, logistic, warehousing, and last not the least, and probably the most important thing is the, is the market linkage of the farm produce. So in a way, we have been connecting small holders of India to the different uh, you know, agribusiness institutions. So as on date, we are connecting these 0.7 million farmers to more than 850 unique agribusinesses while connecting these farmers uh, you know, with different businesses while helping these farmers during each and each stage of their farming cycle. Uh, at the same time, uh, again, uh, the overall approach has always been farmers friendly, farmers first, uh, where approach is not just to uh, exchange the information while to be with them throughout the season. So just one level above Farmers Network, we have been building our own last mile distribution system, last mile uh, you know, supply chain. And that's where we have been building our own network of uh, uh, rural micro entrepreneurs, which is currently 3,000. And with the help of these 3,000 exclusive digitized network of rural micro entrepreneurs, uh, we have our footprints in more than 33,000 Indian villages as of date. Uh, so as on date, Dehat is present in uh, more than seven Indian states. Uh, as I said, that with the, with the network of these 3,000 micro entrepreneurs, we are working with uh, 0.7 million farmers who are active on the platform on day-to-day -day basis. So on day-to-day -day basis, they are buying any agri import, they are selling any farm produce. If not, then they are raising their advisory-related queries. If I talk about the quick milestones, so as on date through our platform, every day we are aggregating close to 1,800 metric ton of produce, uh, whether it's corn or vegetables or, or oil seeds. Every day we are delivering more than 12,000 orders of seed fertilizer to farmers. Every month we are spending close to 3 million minutes with farmers while advising them for sustainable agriculture practices. But again, the best part is the overall TAM or the overall uh, sample size of the problem statement, right, which is huge. And in front of that, the current milestone, it's not even a drop in the ocean. But yeah, the good part is that, you know, the, 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 the value proposition is very well established. The unit economics is, is pretty, pretty strong. And that's the reason why uh, we have a super ambitious goal of aggregating more than 35 million Indian farmers in next uh, four years. We, have, we are aiming to build a network of more than 30,000 
uh, rural micro entrepreneurs to create our footprints in more than uh, uh, 40, uh, 400,000 Indian villages by 2025. Um, in last uh, 23 months, we have raised 46 million US dollar, which is again another validation of uh, uh, what exactly we are building you know, at Deha. So, so, so pretty excited to be here uh, and look forward you know, for a much deeper interaction. Thanks, Shashank. Gaurav, let me hand it over to you. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, Sadat and Soka, thank you so much for having me on the panel. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm floored listening to my esteemed colleagues. Uh, they're solving some really tough problems. Uh, one such tough problem I feel is healthcare. Um, and, you know, healthcare affects folks who are poorer more than it affects folks who can actually afford high quality healthcare within or outside the country. And, um, you know, when we started 1MG in 2015, um, we had a very simple vision. We felt uh, naive, very naive at the time. We felt that if you gave people the right information, which helped them make right decisions, if you gave them the right products and services at the right quality and at the right price, uh, you may be able to make a dent in this otherwise extremely complex problem called healthcare. And uh, with this, uh, you know, lofty goal, but uh, sort of naive, our naivety uh, at the start, we started 1MG. And, you know, 1MG has been probably the most fulfilling journey uh, of at least my life in the, the kind of impact which we've had we've had over the years. To give you some numbers, um, last year we had almost 200 million people, million Indians, you know, almost 20%, 15% uh, of the nation's population come to 1MG to actually access information. Information was our, our main, you know, inroads into healthcare. And the information that we provide is actually uh, around medicines that consumers get prescribed by their doctors. Unlike the West, where when a doctor prescribes you medication, there's a pharmacist who explains the purpose of it, how you're supposed to take it, how it works, etc. Um, there is no such person in India, and we found to 1MG that that was a huge hit need. need. Um, 200 million people come to 1MG to actually access content of medicine, which is available in six different languages. On top of this information platform, we built uh, fundamental transaction platforms, starting out with e-pharmacy, which is medicine delivery at home. Um, we, end, we sort of manage the whole end-to-end -end supply chain, ensuring there's authenticity, quality in the medicines that get delivered to the home. The second service we built was diagnostics. Same problem around trust, quality, information where uh, 1MG uh, today owns a lot of the supply chain uh, for providing high quality lab test services at your home. And uh, the last service we built was consultations, which is you know online consultations, both through video, audio, and chat. We, uh, we, use, um, we use a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning to make sure that patients can access healthcare uh, in in uh, cheaper in cheaper ways uh, without actually affecting quality in any way, shape or form. And our goal is to make sure that uh, you know one MG provides, for lack of a better word, a better alternative to the broken healthcare that exists for everyone in this country today. And you know when we when we look back and think about the impact that we've had, we are actually extremely. Um, extremely gratified when we see that 1MG's biggest and fastest growing areas are actually tier three plus cities. Uh, cities that somehow came online on the back of, you know, cheap internet access like Geo and Airtel, and then suddenly just off growing, you know, massively, which tells us again that we are reaching the right audience, uh, solving the right problems, serving the right needs. And we are very, 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 uh, you know, grateful that Siddharth and his firm were actually part of our journey as well. So that's a little bit about 1MG. Uh, from my, me, I'm, I was born and brought up in Kanpur, uh, did my undergrad from IIT Delhi, spent uh, over a decade in the Bay Area, and then really started to think about what I wanted to do in life, and how I could have more impact, came back to India, and uh, you know, 1MG is the best thing I could have asked for. So yeah, very simple that way. Thanks, Karav.
So clearly the spaces you've each picked and worked in, be that credit or the agri-value chain or healthcare, are immense. And your companies have been at this for a while, six years in the case of 1MG, a decade or so for uh, Kinara as well as for Tehat. Um, if, if we look at the growth of the Indian internet sector, I think it's fair to say most of the people who use your services today weren't part of the Indian internet ecosystem when you started your businesses. So clearly, even though consciously you might not have done it, over time you have had to tweak your products, your offerings uh, in terms of technology, the languages you serve customers in, uh, the pricing, the operational design, etc. cetera. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how that journey has been how those tweaks in your strategy came along to take advantage or to serve this customer segment, this NHP customer segment, who wasn't there when you started off, and how that's impacted your, your growth. So if I flip the order around a little bit, this time, Shashank, if I put you first and ask for your comments, and then we'll go around the table. So, uh, so that to be very honest, in, in, in case of Tehat, when we started, uh, there was no model at all. It was just a thought that in India, if we have more than 140 million farmers, again in India, if this industry is more than $300 billion industry, why can't we build a large sustainable working model around farmers? So this was just a thought, right? I mean, uh, the model solution, I mean, we were a blank slate when we started. And it has been a bottom up journey. So to answer your question, uh, there were few internal debates to Again, I mean to solve or to combat. I mean, I mean, for example, when you when you are looking at farmer, whether you should look at the entire you know wallet share of the farmer across input, advisory, output, or you should focus just one of these you know services, right? So this was like one question we had that like day from day one we should have all the touch points around any individual farmer. Uh, or we, we, should, we should just pick one of these and go to thousands of or millions of farmers and then with respect to time to add more and more touch points on top of that. Obviously, between these two, we chose the first one. Why? Because we wanted to gain confidence uh, from first farmer, right? I mean, uh, whether we are trying, whether we are in a position to change or to, to bring some impact on their livelihood or for the farmer's family or not. So that's why this was something, again, I mean, we got clarity during very early stage of life. Life, that number of farmers, that will come later. But even though this number is mere 14 or 250 or 5,000, let's focus in an, in, an, in, an, in an integrated way, right? I mean, uh, irrespective of the number, how we can provide complete end-to-end -end agricultural services to these farmers. Obviously, when this will get established, then the next task would be to add more and more farmers in a way, right? So obviously, like, this was one thing uh, where uh, we debated a lot and uh, again uh, the good part the fortunate part is that you know, that we got clarity during very early stage of our journey the second uh, design aspect or the second solution part was that uh, again paid versus free uh, crop advisory is something where again uh, we had been working since very first day we knew that you know that crop advisory is something which is very much needed and probably this is the best touch point to build and to strengthen relationship with the farm. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to build a customized crop advisory services, not a generic. Uh, then again, the question in front of us was that whether we should have any subscription fee or we should not. So obviously, then again, we decided not to have any subscription fee. And uh, again, just to compensate that part you know, with other uh, touch points, uh, which is input and output, where uh, again, I mean, obviously, uh, there where you know there was some you know commercials involved in a way. So those were the two main things I think we had to answer ourselves before we started you know replicating. Again, I repeat that you know, that we were fortunate that you know that we could. Uh, I think Shashank might be facing some issues with connectivity. Let's give him a few seconds. If not, we'll we'll keep going. There he is. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I got wrong. Yeah. So I, I was saying that you know, the good the, the good part was that you know that we could get clarity around these, and that's where uh, initially we built each of these services for farmers, 
and then afterwards we started adding more and more farmers so so for initial 5 years the total number of farmers were less than 15000 and then today every month we are adding more than 60000 farmers so uh, so that was one the second uh, i think evolution or the point of inflection the solution was uh, transformation from physical to digital stuff uh again i mean we started in 2012 initially everything was pretty manual whether it was onboarding a farmer or onboarding a micro entrepreneur advising the farmer collecting their data sets so this was quite manual but obviously over the years it everything could you know get transformed to to the digital side and that's why like again i mean where we are today that you know that we have a complete full stack solution right from farm level to farmer to last mile to warehouse to the buyers and sellers as well that's where again i mean while uh, i mean at at this level where again uh, 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 the milestone i had shared uh, at any given point of time we get complete visibility at farm level at farmer level that who is doing what who is buying what selling what what sort of you know queries they are asking even at their land parcel level that you know that what exactly is happening at their land parcel regardless of the size of the farm farm or land parcel level. so those those are the two major aspects i would i like to highlight uh, on the evolution or the transformation on the solution side stuff got it how think about about you what's changed and what design choices have worked for you well i'm going to take off from where shashank was talking about this large shift uh, on digital and the india stack right things that are been such an enabling environment um garo talked about geo and practically free data uh, low cost mobile phones the india stack you know essentially democratizing data in general whether it's identity whether it's trust whether it's uh, this digital view of the of the um, person and the business and so when we started we were a highly touch model because our customers needed that vernacular and last mile distribution and that touch and we did what shashank was talking about we did we collected a lot of information now we had paperless technology from day one so we were collecting in the field di- and, and digitizing information but the biggest shift that has happened in the last 3 4 years has been our ability to get onto the india stack and be able to co- to to fast track a lot of these processes in a very low cost manner which is a very important piece of the puzzle as well the cost element as far as you know that uh, how we can plug in for the kind of loans we do small ticket loans for micro enterprises and what that has a uh, you know and in doing that one of the design decisions we had to make is how far do we go up the technology curve and and leave behind the the people side right and where we where we have landed is a very blended model our customers still like the last mile first pers- service they still want that personalization and yet the processing can be completely digital all of our decisioning is completely automated and so we're taking out the bias from the individual in the field deciding whether i should or are you eligible for a loan and should i sanction your loan to a machine learning model but at the same time they are still making sure that the customer relationship is maintained the customer has a person they can call which is still how you know uh, it, how we operate right at the relationship based level so that was a big critical decision point as the world was shifting around us how do we create a blended tech model and and provide that last mile service um i would say the you know the other uh, piece is also a little bit around expansion it is it is so you know so important that as we think about expansion there's so much pressure to go all india pan india you know pan asia and and it, re- it requires a lot of deep thinking to recognize where we are good at and for us we we decided that we wanted to go deeper in existing geographies it allowed us to build operational efficiency it allowed our employees to get opportunities for career growth it you know there are such there's so much nuance to local regional uh, information style working and and it allowed us to capture that and work with that rather than rush around all over the nation trying to provide the same service we will eventually get there might take me another decade so it's not out of the question but i didn't want to do it right away out of the gate so that was probably a second decision and maybe an interlinked third decision or design decision is more you know 
how much scale do you chase versus profitability? So the scale versus profitability question keeps coming up often. And, um, you know, profitability is where we focused because as a lending institution doing unsecured business loans, which was unheard of or rather not, you know, not well received, but in the ecosystem we operate in, we needed to establish that we had unit level economics down, that while we were doing this for a, you know, financially excluded uh, community, we were still able to build a model that could um, that could stand the test of scrutiny uh, from a banker or a lender perspective. And thank God we did that. Look at the world we've ended up in, where our ability to, you know, to stand our ground has counted for our, uh, you know, for a lot and our, our ability to therefore continue the work we're on, the path we're on, um, having done the profitable part of, uh, of the solving of the business um, uh, problem has been an important element of it. So maybe those three things are my big decision feedback points. <laughs> Got it. Makes sense. And that actually is a, I mean, they've all worked for you. And the the emphasis on profitability over scale is one of those which is the most obvious to somebody who's starting off a business on, by themselves. But given investor pressures, it's something that's not always the most obvious uh, given other constraints and other stakeholders, so but that's 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 a point we'll come back to. Thank you for that, yeah. uh, sure. Gaurav. If I if I turn to you, uh, I mean, you've you guys have clearly done a fair bit of innovation around this, and I see comments on the chat about exclusion and how that how that could also be something that technology always doesn't take into account. And I know in your basic thesis of language as and, and making that all encompassing, that's the starting point of what you guys have started off with. So speak to us a little bit about how that journey has been, how those innovations have panned out for you at Wamanji. You know, that's a, that's a great question, actually. And, um, you know, six years in, um, I feel that while we were correct in a few areas around how technology actually bridges the digital divide or, or the divide, you know, between the haves and the have-nots, I also feel that today we are a lot more, uh, we have a lot more humility around how it actually creates divides as well. And um, to give you an example, I think, uh, you know, our content's available in, in six different Indian languages more coming. A uh, significant amount of people actually now access 1MG in, in the local language, you know, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Gujarati, etc. Right. So, so. It's ha it hasn't been easy, you know, it takes a fair amount of effort to actually keep everything updated, working in many different languages. So, so that was, that was, I think, an easy win for us uh, to get going. But then, you know, I think our belief that people will open an app and sort of order, you know, order their tests or order their medicines, um, you know, also points to the fact that just, just getting internet doesn't mean that people suddenly become tech savvy, right? And they know what this checkout flow means and what search means and, you know, how how do you do this, you know, payment thingy and how do you figure out the OTP copying and stuff, right? So I, I think some of this has also been a realization that in in especially the the impact micro market, if you will, where there is now technology access, but maybe not a lot of technical literacy, right? And we've seen markets sort of evolve from uh, <clears throat> not having technical, not having, uh, let's say, tech access to getting tech access to becoming consumers of content, right? So a lot of people consume a lot of content. They'll go to YouTube, they'll go to 1NG, they'll read everything they can, but don't, don't become transactors initially, right? And so some of our, our thinking has also gone <clears throat> through an evolution where we started to realize that people are at different journeys. And, you know, it's an acceptance that, you know, the old fashioned idea based based order placement, right, or WhatsApp based order placement are actually good technological interventions as well, you know, and everything doesn't need to be an app. And, uh, you know, it, it took us it took us a while and I'm sharing this because it took us a while to actually accept that, you know, that's technology as well. And to someone that's actually high in technology and for us to actually accept and adopt it wholeheartedly. I'm not sure if we still adopt it, accept it wholeheartedly, but, you know, that was a big switch for us to make, right? We were so digital all the time that 
you know, four years back when we started alternate channels, it faced a fair amount of uh, pushback within the organization. Our technology didn't want to build tools for it because, you know, oh my God, it's taking a step back. So, so I think for us, that was like a key learning, right? Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the third learning that we had was that uh, we were so focused on service quality levels, right? So if you're serving, let's say, a consumer in Delhi, uh, his service expectations are very, very high. And without realizing um, explicitly, we assume that that's the service quality level that everyone across the country needs, okay? And that was another illusion that broke over time that a lot of rural India, a lot of tier three plus India was just happy to get service, you know, was just happy to have choices, was just happy to get their medicines uh, in, in three to five days versus, you know, having to actually make a trip to the city um, or get a relative to actually, you know, parcel it through India Post um, and, you know, it getting lost, etc. So... So, you know, that realization also became very important where we actually started to use uh, centralized fulfillment locations to service Pan-India, uh, built a lot of technology for it. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Tier 3 Plus is one of our largest segments uh, growing very, very rapidly. And so we are increasingly setting up new uh, supply chain points and new supply chain tech. It requires something completely different because in a lot of places, you know, transportation is a challenge. And uh, we were just we were just looking at a model where, you know, you can't in these segments you can't work directly. Typically, you have to work with a middleman because you know that's the guy who's built all this intelligence around using an app and ordering for other people. You know, how do you use that that point as a hub? Or let's say drop-offs of orders, etc. So I would I would say these three are the are the key technological interventions that we've made uh, to make our technology you know more accessible. Fascinating. I think the interesting point I take away from this is technology is an enabler, but sometimes there's a risk of making technology the product. Yeah. And that that might not work. It, yeah. uh, it's a design choice you guys took to make sure it was tailored to the needs, just because you thought and we thought app was cool doesn't mean that the user thinks app is cool. How do we do the right messaging for the individual? And the same, Hardika, for you, where you took a conscious design call saying you could actually make everything paperless and make everything online, but that's not what your customer wants. Uh, you need to have that blend across the board. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it, an, an anecdote comes to mind, right? So if you look at the shopping experience all, all of us have, it's really the, the, the US supermarket shopping experience ported onto a website. You, Amazon started off with the cart, which was a, the analog of the shopping experience in the aisles in a physical supermarket. And that there became the de facto and the default standard across the world. But if you take that experience to an Indian, to a person in tier two, tier three India, that person is not shopping in a supermarket. She's never been there. She's shopping in the local neighborhood store and the owner of that store is telling her, this is nice, buy this, et cetera, right? So that's really the innovation that is driving the, the next phase of growth in e-commerce in India. Because the first wave got stuck at the top 50 to 60 million users. And really changing that paradigm has been critical in expanding the universe of folks that the e-commerce space can serve. So thank you. That was an excellent reminder of how we sometimes get uh, sucked into our own myth that technology by itself is enough when it really becomes just an enabler for this to become a, a solid business. Uh, we are in the last 10 minutes of our of our time here. And I wanted to focus now on another question that had come up in the chat, which was the choices between impact and scale. And I say that also in the context of cap tables, because once you take outside money, it's not just what the founders think. It's what other people are also saying who have a stake in the company as shareholders and influencers. Uh, each of you has taken money from fo investors focused on impact and has also taken money from investors uh, who are more commercially minded, traditional commercial VCs. In, in one MTS case, Gaurav, you've now uh, gone through a M&A transaction where a large Indian corporate house is, uh, manages and, and owns equity in the company. How have you specifically seen that balance play out 
is that so simple question founder versus investor pulling together pulling in different directions impact versus scale is it a journey that you take together or is it a is it a battle that you fight each step along the way uh, so hardik if i can start with you and then we we'll go around the table on this one sure so look at kinara transforming lives livelihoods and local economies is our mission and and our financial and financial in, our focus on financial inclusion is such a large opportunity that it provides uh, you know enough um, uh, comfort for both financial investors and impact investors right so we have, we are never debating about uh, th- whether th- we should or shouldn't do this uh because what we do is core to how we operate the entire business is structured ar- around this opportunity and so that that has not been a challenge i think the the more nuances and i think i see a question here about mission drift etc as well and how investors you know push towards that i think the more nuanced part of this is is more back to that scale profitability you know question that it's as investors have have funds they have cycles they need exit time frames that perhaps there is a push for scale and 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 is there you know is there a question around how that scale needs to be achieved by moving to adjacent segments and that's where i i would say the mission uh, of uh, mission drift you know starts to creep in and it really just requires you to be focused and you know and clear on what what it is that the company stands for this is what kinara has done we have focused on the micro enterprise segment we have been focused on it on this segment for the last 10 years we are not deviating it from it we are not changing tracks and and we are making sure that this story is so powerful that whether it's an impact investor or or a, or a finance first investor that there is something for everybody in it got it makes sense uh, shashank your thoughts So I think before investor it's a important question for every entrepreneur right i mean one has to go through every day uh i believe uh, both are important uh, without any obviously confusion uh obviously why because as an entrepreneur you feel good right when you see your impact is uh reaching to a scale right so more than someone else is asking right i think uh, it also excites every entrepreneur when you will see that you know that the impact from where you had started that's reaching to a different scale right so that's one again in the context of dehat uh, uh we raised our first institutional capital after 7 years of our uh, our, our our inception uh so again uh, being a first generation entrepreneur i once i can't say that you know that this was the plan <laughs> but uh, but that's how it happened uh and primarily because as a as a team as model we wanted to you know get that confidence that you know that let's say now whenever we are ready i mean that are we really you know ready for scale up uh, uh you know journey or not so i think when we gained that confidence then we started raising our institutional capital so first initial 6 and a half years 7 years we took a lot of you know debt we took money from angel right so we didn't uh, uh, you know have to deal with that you know question what you are actually asking and then last past two two and a half years when we started raising institutional capital again uh, 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 we had uh, this uh, again we were fortunate to be in a position to choose the, our investors in a way uh the first uh, institution invest- in- investors in fact we chose in fact who uh, you know have some understanding of you know agri right who understand you know impact and then with respect to time again i mean every time i think we just maintain that equilibrium but i think but last not the least what really helped us four co-founders seven years of you know grassroots experience cumulative 28 years it will take a lot of you know effort to anyone to drift us away so by the time basically we got investors on cap table by that time we knew that what we have to so i, I think there we are uh, lastly i think i would agree with hardika i think uh, for any investors their their own respective fund cycle is important uh, so again i mean in the context of the hat uh, it's been just two years in fact like the oldest investor on our cap table is just two years old and uh, still and like we, uh, and uh, 
more than investor i think uh, or someone else is saying as a as a promoter as an entrepreneur again we believe that this is a growth stage every year we are growing by 4x and 5x so so again i mean because of all these facts and reason again uh, we didn't uh, uh, you know have to go through this 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 phase uh, you know sita so like correct karof you have a an additional perspective to that which is not just investors but also uh, having been through the mna part of the of the journey what are your thoughts on this uh, <laughs> um yeah look uh, i think there are two parts to your question right one is that uh, do you guys build something together or do you go in opposite directions i think uh, or different directions you know when you have any more than one human being involved in in the building up of any enterprise whatsoever people will go in different directions right and i i think that what we've seen is that the diverse perspectives have been extremely helpful we've had uh, our our investor you know badri from omedia come in often with a very different perspective than let's say some of the traditional uh we see that we've had on the cap table and we've been very fortunate right because we we fall in such an interesting intersection of impact and financial vc that we've had you know benefits of both and and some of the best investors in the world in both you know we've had bill and melinda gates foundation on our cap table for a bit um you know before before the transaction we've had uh, ifc uh, sort of uh, in a quasi impact and then of course we have on the as well right and we have some of the best financial investors as well you know sequoia maverick uh, you name them so i feel that the diverse perspectives help and the second the second part of the question is actually more interesting the impact versus scale and i'm not sure if they are two different things and you know sure if you could affect one person's life and have an impact there it it's great but you know i just very strongly feel that as an enterprise unless you can affect the lives of thousands and tens of thousands and millions you know you have a potential with capital to do so much more that why would you settle for less right and so for us it has always been very very clear that for us impact is equal to scale and there's no difference between the two and we've seen that play out remarkably well in the 1mg journey lastly about the mna portion um i think that uh, the mna was was actually it actually happened because we see the tata group also as as a group that that has a financial motive but impact at heart they have probably you know they were they were named i think recently as one of the largest biggest philanthropy uh, groups in the world one of the biggest individual philanthropists as well and there's something there's something good about everything they do you know somewhere along the way their hearts in the right place uh they don't cut corners where it matters and you know that was a big deal for us that healthcare is so important that sure we, you could get you could get swayed by just making money and making profits but you have to do the right things you know you have to do the right by the people who trust you for you know their healthcare needs and which is where you know it became very important to pick a partner uh, who just didn't think about money and scale but who also brought to the table a philosophy on doing the right things for the right reasons right and that's what I, i think that's what impact is all about right doing the right things for the right reasons you know not just for money and actually affecting people's lives positively in whichever way that you can and that's really been our journey and our learning from the soul experience fascinating and that's actually a pretty deep insight it's impact and scale really isn't a choice it isn't a choice from your experience also if the basic dynamics of the business are what drive scale which is what attracts the investors to come alongside because they bought into the model then it's more about taking diverse views to make that end state more robust as opposed to fighting about whether this direction or that i think that's that's a pretty a pretty strong insight that that we can build off uh i see we are at our time and i'm going to request advice from the uh organizers if we have time for a last uh question or whether we are beyond our time but it's been fascinating and just chancing luck let me just put put out that one if you were to as entrepreneurs who build business of scale have one bit of advice 
to a new entrepreneur starting off on a similar journey where you were 10 years back, trying to figure out how do I use this massive efflorescence in technology to build a scale business? What advice would you have for that, that entrepreneur? Uh, Adhika, let's start with you, then Shashank, then Gaurav, and then we can wrap up. Embrace uncertainty. It's going to come at you from every direction. And while we talk a lot about you know, mission and impact and scale, really just uh, being able to ride with, with whatever is thrown at you is going to take you far. Absolutely. Shashank? So that I don't think I qualify for this, but uh, but <laughs> if you ask, and again nothing new, just uh, uh, again uh, relate yourself with a problem statement that why you are doing whatever you are, and then think long term. The rest everything will 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 get settled down with respect to time. I think this is what I think we have learned from our own journey. Right? So that's why uh, again uh, and we and uh, knowing that you know that. The sector where we are in, right? It's going to be a long race, right? So yeah, makes sense. Gaurav, I think very similar to Shashank. Uh, only thing to add is technology is a tool. Uh, use it wisely. Use it to your advantage, but never lose sight of the of the people you serve and uh, the impact that you seek to make. I think uh, we often forget. In this whole halabalu of scale and valuations and money and technology and AI and ML, we often forget about the customer who's at the core of everything. And I'm being very honest, you know, we often forget about the customer who's at the core of everything. And, um, you know, as a founder, uh, as an entrepreneur, if you can somehow always keep going back to that North Star and be honest to yourself, uh, are you making a real impact? Are you doing what is the right thing to do? I think everything else just becomes a lot easier in the whole process. Fascinating. Sage advice. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, Shashank. Thank you, Hardika, for this uh, session. Much, much appreciated. My sense is we can keep going on, but we have overstayed our welcome by at least five minutes. <laughs> so with that, uh, thank you to the audience. And uh, I hope you have a good day ahead. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everyone Thank who listened to us. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.